So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, as you know, we have our patient education session. There's a number of presenters. Um, there's myself, there's Chloe, our registered dietitian at Health Sciences North, Tracy Franklin, our clinical manager, and our the hematologist, Dr. Gopala Krishnan, will be joining us around five. Um, in between, we're going to switch laptops. Um, we have a slight issue with the laptops in the settings, so just bear with us. If you haven't registered, there is a registration form there. Even if you registered online, again, sorry, I keep repeating it, but please just even just sign in your name so we can keep track of who's attending. And so one more thing, the session is being recorded, but not, um, not the video cam, just the speaking and the content. And why we're recording it is so we can send it out again to you and everyone else that missed it, that isn't here today. So again, thank you for joining me today. My name is Sarah, I'm the Community Engagement Manager with LSC, and I'm thrilled to be here. And when I say that, I literally mean it because I missed my flight this morning and I drove home. <laughs> so I am thrilled to be here. I did, I did. I was like, oh, I think it's only 4 p.m., sure. <laughs> So yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that you guys took the time to be here and you know, I hope you take away some learning from our education session and learn more about us. So very quickly, I'm going to go through some background information about blood cancers and then get into what our patient education programs and resources are. And that's not just for the patients, it's for survivors, caregivers, and healthcare professionals um, as well. So every 23 minutes, someone is diagnosed with a blood cancer in Canada. They account for 11% of the new cancer cases. Um, one third of men uh, have the blood cancer diagnosis and one fourth of women out of all the blood cancers have blood, uh, blood cancer diagnosis. So it is a significant concern. Out of all the different blood cancers, and there's 137 different ones, Lymphoma is the most common with about 43,335 individuals diagnosed. And in kids, leukemia is the most common form of childhood <coughs> cancer. There's about over 900 um, blood cancer cases for kids and leukemia is it. So overall, collectively in Canada, there's 138,100 individuals diagnosed with blood cancer. In Ontario, that's about 10,100. So it's a significant public health concern that doesn't even capture the caregivers, the families. So it is very important to us. Um, as an organization, our mission is to cure blood cancers and improve the quality of life for patients and their families. Uh, we are an affiliate of the Leukemia Lymphoma Society in the U.S., and you may have overheard that conversation in the beginning that I was having with Leah, that a lot of our materials and programs are shared resources, but they are um, evidence-based resources, and they are very comprehensive in that they cover all the blood cancers. So, again, um, with our main mandate in our mission, it's heavily uh, focused on research, so everything that we're fundraising and collecting in terms of donation, it is being reinvested back into the blood cancer world in the form of research and supporting families across Canada. So in terms of that support, we have regional offices across the country in BC, in Quebec, um, and in the Atlantic side as well, and a heavy volunteer base that you will see supporting our Light the Night events, and even our major big patient ed events, we have a lot of volunteers that come out and support us. So in terms of supporting patients, we are connecting with patients throughout their cancer journey. So it's through diagnosis, through their treatment, and through their survivorship. And we're providing our support in terms of the educational information or access to our programs. As I mentioned before, we're heavily invested on the research side. So we have about 3.8 million that we're investing and that really translates, translates into about 32 or 33 research projects or research clinicians that we're funding for the organization. And as you can see, this gives you kind of a little bit of a timeline from what research advances have come to. Um, it used to be firstly chemotherapy and now we've moved to really highly targeted therapies 
um, and personalized care, such as CAR T and precision medicine. So, and what that is for LSC is that we've been behind funding those researchers that have contributed to those advances. So it's a great milestone for us. So the next few slides really covers what our programs are, what our services are. Um, in terms of the support, firstly, it's provided to you for free. Um, you can access our information online, in person, such as today, or over the phone. And when you call in, you're connected to our patient educators, and they're across the country. And what they're doing is they're facilitating you or connecting you to the best available information. So they're not commenting on your blood cancer diagnosis or your treatment plan. Instead, they're helping support you and connecting you to the organization's resources, or if you wanted information externally in the community, such as community support groups, or help understanding some financial supports that are available to you, uh, we're there to help and connect and provide you that information. In terms of our programs, we have the Information Resource Center. So this is a shared program through the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. And this is your one-stop shop um, expert information for blood cancer. When you call into this number, um, you can call them, you can email them, or web-based chat with them. You're connected to a master's level oncology expert that's either a nurse, a social worker, or a health educator, and they assist you with the information about diagnosis and treatment. So they are the people that we're referring patients to when they have um, uh, com like the issues understanding some terminology or maybe complications understanding some of the information that was provided to them, we prefer to refer them to this uh, resource because they are the experts that can help with that. Um, but again, they're not commenting on your diagnosis or treatment, they're just helping clarify terminology and helping you understand the different routes or pathways that you're taking. Um, the support is available in 170 languages through a translation service. Um, of course, for Canada, it's mostly English and French and a few other languages. A lot of our information is also translated in other languages, so you can download that off our website. And then there is a registered dietitian that's providing you nutritional counseling. So that's a great resource um, for anybody in the room that's interested. You know, call in and have a chat with them. Within that support center, there's also a clinical trial coordinator, and that's staffed by a nurse educator, and what she's doing is really doing a step-by-step -step, uh, intake with patients that are calling in, helping them understand what clinical trials are, what options are available to them, and then mailing you a list of available clinical trials in Canada and the U.S. So that really helps minimize any extra work that you may have to do or your family may have to do, or even for the healthcare professionals in the room. You know, it would help you as a resource. Uh, to connect and get that information. Of course, everything that you're doing um, and requesting information with the Clinical Trial Support Center has to be in sync with what your healthcare provider here in Ontario is doing. So you would take that list back with them and discuss that information and discuss what routes or options if you were considering a clinical trial. And then we have the First Connection Program. This is our peer-to-peer -peer support program. So it matches newly diagnosed patients or caregivers to somebody that's in remission. And we match specifically by blood cancer type, by your age, by where you live, and if there are certain language criteria or preferences, because we do have a, a pretty strong database for French-speaking patients as well. So um, they're connected to French survivors as well. And then for everybody, we have a number of resources, and they're in audio, video, and downloadable format. If you visit this website, um, you have access to a lot of evidence-based information on a variety of blood cancers and some really neat new tools like podcasts and videos that are constantly updated. Majority of it is coming from the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, but we are actively working on getting a lot of Canadian material and content, and you're gonna see some slides about that. So the next one um, in Canada is in October, and if you visit this website, lscanada.org slash webcast, 
you're able to access all of our archived webcasts that have come up. Um, what's great is this one's taking place in Alberta, but you know people here can also register and watch this in Ontario. And you can watch it live so you can post your questions in the chat and have them answered while that webcast is occurring. I think um, if you do it afterwards, there's a bit of a delay in following up. So it, it is in your best interest to try to watch it live. Then patient education events like this one, the next one is going to be in Newmarket, although that's a fair bit of a drive from here. And I would know. <laughs> yeah. I would know. Yeah. I don't recommend that. Um, but if you are still interested, what I'm trying to do with these events, like today, I'm trying to have them virtually available as well. So whoever couldn't be in February can still benefit from like the hematologist talk, your talk, Tracy's talk, if it's relevant. You know, like it's still useful. So if you register for this, and this is a really neat event, it's a, a psychotherapist that's coming out to speak about mind-body interventions dealing with a cancer diagnosis. And she's going to specify that to um, blood cancers. So it may be a neat tool. And then what's new to the organization completely are our resources for the pediatrics and the adult youth population. So I brought some on hand and I'm gonna try to drop them off through Tracy because I couldn't meet with Pogo earlier today. So hopefully you'll have a chance to share those. But for anybody else, they're downloadable off our website or you can get in touch with me and I can send them out to you. And then um, I hope you've all heard of Light the Night. It is our annual fundraiser. It also takes place in Sudbury. So if you haven't heard of it, you can certainly come out tomorrow and Tracy's going to speak to it. So since we're not governmentally funded, it is very important to us to hold these events. Um, these events raise awareness for the cause. We end up uh, receiving donations that are reinvested into patient education and research. And they're very important to connect the patients, the survivors, the caregivers, and those that are walking in memory. Um, lastly, I wanted to just raise awareness about a research study that we're collaborated with um, Dr. Samantha Mayo from the University of Toronto. She's interested in having eligible lymphoma survivors participate in a telephone interview. And what this will do is really help inform healthcare services. So they're interested in improving some survivorship with healthcare services in Ontario. And they're recruiting um, patients for that study, or sorry, survivors for that study. So we did bring the poster and it's sitting with the other materials. If anybody's interested, please pick that up. But I'll just open the floor for questions. So again, I went through it very quickly. Um, if there was any further information or resources that you're interested in, um, certainly my business card is there and you have my contact information, feel free uh, to connect because I realized I went through it fairly quickly. So yeah, thank you. So I think we need to do a quick switch now. <laughs> Okay. I'm really excited at the turnout here. This is the first time we've had the Leukemia Lymphoma Society come to Sudbury. So it's, it's going to be a great uh, first of many education sessions. I took uh, on the patient education lead here at the Northeast Cancer Center and for the Northeast region about a year or and a half ago, I want to say. So um, we're slowly starting to build our patient education portfolio and try to, you know, expand it and open it to uh, patients and make sure patients are included all the time. I think it's an important part of care. My other role here is as a uh, a manager. I, I actually started out as a registered social worker many, many years ago here at the Cancer Center, and uh, I, I manage what's called the Psychosocial Oncology Program. And essentially what this means is this is a team of people who 
provide all of your care alongside perhaps your oncologist and your nurse. So for example, registered dietitians whom you'll hear from today, social workers who provide counseling and support, physiotherapists who um, often people don't think how does physiotherapy fit into it, but can provide a lot of help with respect to rehabilitation and coping with fatigue and or mobility difficulties. Um, I should probably just maybe actually move my slides. Okay, here. Okay. So we know that psychosocial oncology is really the, our supportive care program. That is our title here. It may be called different things at different cancer centers, but here it's called the supportive care program. And we really are here to provide support to people affected by cancer, both emotionally, physically, uh, practically. And because we all know that the emotional and cognitive components of cancer may not necessarily be addressed in your oncology or your medical appointments. However, it's a significant impact on your quality of life. Um, so the emotions you experience when you're first diagnosed, the emotions you experience when you're going through treatment or the fatigue, uh, you know, the sleep or appetite difficulties. Um, and then when you're done treatment, the ongoing sort of side effects that can keep going even though you're done treatment, um, you know, fear, fear of recurrence, anxiety, things like that. These aren't necessarily addressed in a very quick medical appointment that's, you know, 15, 20 minutes long or sitting in a chemotherapy chair. So we really want our patients and families to know that the supportive care program is here to provide that support. And our team can provide this support at any point during this cancer trajectory, whether you're initially diagnosed, whether you're going through treatment, uh, whether you're done treatment. We have, uh, as a social worker, I would see patients a year or two out of treatment who might still be coping with some challenges with, you know, side effects either emotionally or even things with respect to returning to work, you know, those kinds of aspects. Um, and certainly we often provide, the social workers here provide a lot of support to family members as well. And I think that's important. And you're going to see more of that coming out actually because our body, our governing body, Cancer Care Ontario, is starting to put significantly more effort into ensuring that caregivers are treated as well as patients. Because we know it's as much of a um, you know, emotional and physical burden on the caregivers, families who may be picking up, you know, roles that they didn't play or just picking up the slack and things like that, um, and also coping with their own emotions, their fear for their loved ones. So the social workers are here to provide that kind of support to family members as well, including children. Uh, so, for example, we often see you know, children who have been diagnosed with a cancer, uh, but we also provide support to children who have a parent or, or grandparent or some loved one with, with cancer, or whatever, however that is defined. So as I mentioned, these are some of the needs that individuals living with cancer can experience um, and families as well. I mean, it runs the gamut and, you know, there is no one size fits all. Some people uh, you know, maybe experience less or more, and there's no norm. So it's however you experience this journey. Uh, so you're going to hear from Chloe, so I'm not going to even talk about dietitians. <laughs> not, there's other dietitians in the room right now. They're all eyeing me. And that, eyebrows went up when we heard that there's a registered yes. dietitian. I saw that. So that's because we were like, okay. Um, because, you know, we often will do that. We will do that a little bit because we actually take a lot of pride uh, in, in our work and the oncology workers in the supportive care program are strongly invested in providing like the best care they can. So these are the folks who have studied specifically areas in oncology so that they can ensure they're giving you the latest information, the best information, they know where to go, they know how to help. Um, we have a speech language pathologist as well. She mainly works with our head and neck cancer population. So that's her main role. Um, and certainly we have an Aboriginal navigator. And her role is really designed to help our Aboriginal patients navigate through the system, helping with 
uh, things like travel, accommodation, all of that kind of stuff. Our medicine lodge keeper is somebody who can provide a lot of spiritual and cultural support to our Indigenous population, so she's part of our team as well. Uh, and new to our team, we actually will be uh, having a psychiatrist join us in a couple of months. The psychiatrist will be consulting with us. Uh, he specifically has uh, is interested in working with oncology patients and working in palliative care as well. So that's going to be very new to our team, and we're pleased to see that happening. So I'll just tell you, we have registered dietitians, but I'm not going to talk anymore about them. <laughs> um, our physiotherapist is in the room over there. Uh, and physiotherapy and oncology is uh, help. Again, she works with any cancer site um, and any age, so they are able to work with children. We don't see a lot of children coming to physiotherapy because there are specialists in uh, child physiotherapy, but she is able to do that. So sometimes she may see some of our pediatric oncology patients. Uh, but a big role is the rehabilitation. So we know that patients, um, once they've gone through treatment, they're less active. They, even if you may have been really physically active prior to your diagnosis, you may become a little deconditioned or very fatigued. Maybe you have some sleep difficulties. Um, so there is a lot of uh, exercise recommendations that can be made with respect to sort of getting back on track. Um, and certainly, you know, fatigue is probably experienced 80 to 90 percent of all cancer patients experience fatigue. Um, I have a little bit of fatigue, but I'm, I'm not going to touch on it today. It literally is its own class, um, which we have here. And uh, the fatigue class is specifically run by our dietitian and our physio and our social work. So um, you're welcome to, we run it monthly. You're always welcome to take part in that. Um, so this is what some of our social workers do in oncology. Often we will assist patients also navigate this crazy healthcare system, whether we are helping people with travel uh, accommodations, sometimes people have to get down to Toronto quickly for certain specialists or tests, we can often uh, help to assist with that. Income replacement, so cancer uh, takes a big hit on people's income when you have to leave work. Um, some people are lucky enough to have disability, but even then it may not cover whatever you used to make. So. There's a big hit, and our social workers are there to help out look at different options, government options, and things like that. And so that's the instrumental part, but then the other big part is coping with the emotional aspects of having a cancer, living with cancer, um, the different levels of distress that that might occur, different family relationship issues that come up that are very common. Um, you know, how do you talk to kids about cancer? What do you tell them? All that kind of stuff. They've been well coached with a lot of uh, lots of sort of post um, university training to talk about special oncology issues. The other thing that I don't have here, though, that I actually am criticized for not talking about that's very important is sexuality. So the cancer center uh, social workers have all received specialized training with respect to sexuality in oncology. Sometimes people are like, "That is like the last thing on my mind." But we actually know it's an extremely important part of people's relationships, intimacy, body image, all of that kind of stuff. It goes along with um, you know, how you communicate with your partner, all of that kind of stuff. So you're, many things could come up. And if you have a question, you should just call and let the social worker help you sort things out because that's what they're there for. You don't have to come with answers. They'll help you through it. So some of the things that come up along the way are... Um, Different, as you can see, side effects with respect to emotional distress at different points along the cancer trajectory. Um, when you come to the cancer center, if you've come for an appointment already or you will be coming for an appointment, you are asked to fill out an ESAS or your patient reported symptom measure. You probably maybe have heard those words. <laughs> I see people nodding like, yes, I am still asked to fill out the ESAS. <laughs> Um, there's lots to come with these thoughts. Lots of changes will be happening uh, with respect to nursing care and how they're going to be using those patient-reported tools. So this is your voice to say, yeah, these are the symptoms I'm experiencing and rate those symptoms and be open and honest with your medical 
doctor, your oncologist or your nurse or your radiation therapist, whomever it is, to say, yes, I am struggling with this symptom. How can I be helped? You know, sometimes they'll give you education. Nurses are more than capable of providing education to manage side effects. But maybe you need a little bit more, and that's where they'll say, you know what, maybe if you've lost mm-hmm. gadget weight, you need to talk to the dietitian and look at some sort of specialized treatment. Um, I know I feel like I'm talking a lot too fast, but I don't want to take you time. <laughs> so I'm just going to say, okay, so I'm just going to stop there because I don't want to go into a whole sort of thing, but again, I'll just put in a little plug for our education session that we run on fatigue that you're more than welcome to attend or bring family, friends, whomever you want. And I think there's information on the back. If not, you're more than welcome to contact me. Is there any questions about the supportive care program here at the Cancer Center? We provide support to not just Sudbury area patients, but through all of the Northeast. So we do serve our cancer patients all the way up to the James Bay Coast, uh, east to Mattawa, west to Walla, and south to Perry Sound. So if you're in that big Lynn 13, I think we're in, um, that is, you're welcome to give us a call. I'm not sure if I'm not happy. It worked. It's just the same way. It might be the same way. Lots of snacks, Did it briefly show up on the screen? No. Do you have a purse on your laptop? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. I don't understand why that popped in. I know. We have a backup laptop. For the sake of the recording, I'm just going to say I'm just going to see you guys on the screen for the recording here. For the last portion. And then keep track of it. Yeah, but you're going to say I'm going to move the slide. I call it just click my slide. Yeah. 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 Oh, it worked. We're just to go. I'm so sorry. I don't know. I don't know what that glitch was. So now, yeah, we're all good to go. Perfect. Let me introduce Chloe. Chloe is one of our new sites here at the Cancer Center in the Northeast, and she has prepared an awesome presentation on nutrition that. Uh, it's very important to people. We get all kinds of calls and questions about nutrition and cancer care all the time, including uh, lots of many, you know, strange and interesting comments and questions about nutrition. So I'll let Chloe yeah. talk a little bit more about that. Good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, so 
so yes, thank you for the introduction. I'm, this is an awesome turnout, so I really appreciate everyone coming out. I'm, I'm a new kid on the block here at the Supportive Care Department, so this is my first time presenting um, with this department, so I really do appreciate the, the turnout. It's awesome. All right, so um, like Tracy had mentioned, uh, we get a lot of odd nutrition questions, um, you know, different perceptions when it comes to what healthy eating is following a cancer diagnosis. So what I wanted to do today was just kind of bring forward and shed some light on some of those common myths and misconceptions, just so that we all leave today a little bit more educated in terms of what healthy eating is uh, following a cancer diagnosis. All right. So as you can see, you know, when you do a quick Google search, these are the types of things that, that seem to pop up. Uh, and, and following a cancer diagnosis, I mean, it's, it's no wonder that people get somewhat confused uh, because there's so much misinformation out there. You know, whether we're looking at, you know, websites or blogs or books or, or news articles for that matter, there's so much info out there. And for anyone who doesn't have, you know, a solid nutrition education, you know, like registered dietitians, I can, I can completely understand how it would be very difficult to kind of decipher between what is true, good, evidence-based information and, and what information that we can, you know, kind of just leave behind. So, again, today shed some light on some of those common misconceptions um, that I'm sure many of you have, you know, read or, or heard in passing. So let's get started. Uh, Sugar feeds cancer, <laughs> um, or you know, does avoiding sugar help uh, prevent the risk of cancer? Does sugar uh, directly feed um, or fuel cancer cells? Uh, I would say by far this is the number one misconception that uh, that I hear from from patients. But it's it's no criticism on on you guys. It's, it's no wonder that people you know believe things like this because when we see news articles or you know things like this pop up in the news, uh, it's no wonder that people are going to, you know, listen to it and, and, and start believing things like this. So, to, you know, to start out, I just want to look at, at the evidence. Everything that I'm presenting today is evidence-based. Um, there's been research done on it. I would never recommend anything, um, you know, to a patient of mine that, you know, wasn't evidence-based by any means. All right. So, sugar, you know, when we're looking at sugar itself, it's it's a fuel source. It's what our body uses for energy. It's our, it's our preferred energy source, actually, when we're looking at, you know, protein and fat and, and sugar. Sugar is what, you know, our body cells require. Now, sugar does not have the ability to pick and choose which cells it's going to provide energy to. Okay, when we're looking at it, it's that sugar, we have to realize that sugar doesn't feed our cancer cells any more or any less than it feeds all of the cells of our body, okay, for, for proper brain function, for, for maintaining adequate energy levels. We absolutely need sugar in our diet. So the downside of people kind of, you know, believing that sugar could directly fuel cancer growth is that this misconception often leads people to try and overly restrict or avoid sugar, you know, in their diet completely. And when I'm talking about sugar, I'm not just talking about the cookies on the table. I'm talking about, you know, fruit. I'm talking about all of our grain products, our, our dairy products. Those are all carbohydrate sources. And carbohydrates, when we digest them, when we break them down into their you know, smallest molecules, we're left with glucose. That is, that is sugar. Okay? It doesn't matter if it comes from a banana or the chocolate chip cookie, at the end of the day, our body is going to use that energy the same way. And that's something that I really don't think a lot of people necessarily really understand. Okay? We also have to realize this. The body has these awesome backup strategies. So even if we're not necessarily consuming carbohydrates, our body will use other things and turn them in to glucose into that sugar for energy. So, you know, we're going to be breaking down fat stores muscle stores, um, which can lead to muscle wasting and, and unintentional weight loss throughout treatment, which is absolutely something that we, that we want to be avoiding at all costs. We need to make sure that our energy levels that are up, our, our weight is maintained uh, at a stable um, level. So I think that believing in, in, in misconceptions like this can actually do much more harm, much more harm than good. 
Okay, so I think, you know, bottom line is just understanding that sugar is necessary for, for regular bodily functions. Um, doesn't feed cancer cells any more, any less than, than all of our cells in our body. And following a diet that's overly restricting carbohydrates and sugar, it's so restrictive, um, and that in itself can be can be quite difficult to to keep up with in the long run. So, not something that I would that I would recommend. Anyway. All right. Okay. So moving on, I'm going to touch base on a few fad diets that have come become quite popular in recent years. So the first one is the alkaline diet. Um, so this diet is is based on two core premises or, or principles, I should say. Um, so number one, this diet tells us that if we pick and choose certain foods, so if we consume more of certain foods and less of other foods, you know, depending, um, that can change the level of acidity or alkalinity of our body. So we think of something that's acidic, the opposite of that is alkaline. Okay, so that's number one. And number two, it tells us that cancer can only thrive in an acidic environment. So by choosing certain foods that create a more alkaline environment, we're able to you know, prevent or, or stop cancer growth. So that's what this diet tells us anyway. Um, it's no shocker, uh, this diet is not based on science whatsoever. <laughs> okay, so if, if you've heard about this diet, if you know of a, a family member or a friend who, who saw this diet in the past, just know that it, it is not evidence-based. There's no science behind it. Okay, so that's just to clear the air on that one. <laughs> um, so I put together, this is just, it gives examples of, you know, acid-forming foods that they, that they qualify as acid-forming and then alkaline-forming foods. Um, so you'll notice here on, you know, on the red side, which is, you know, the foods to avoid, because apparently it caused our body to become more acidic, we're going to notice a lot of really, really great protein sources here. So things, you know, like beans and meats and dairy products and fish, all fantastic protein sources. So anyone who, you know, would buy into this diet and, and follow this diet, they would likely have a heck of a hard time meeting their estimated protein needs. And, and for some of you who might not know, individuals who are diagnosed with cancer have greater protein requirements. So you need more protein, and following this diet makes it that much harder to attain our goal. So, again, something that's overly restrictive that at the end of the day uh, is definitely not beneficial in, in any way. And when we're, you know, if we're not meeting our estimated protein needs, our, our body's got to get protein somewhere. So we're going to notice muscle wasting as well as weight loss. Two things that I mentioned before are definitely things that we, that we want to avoid at all costs as we're going through treatment. So I would say bottom line for this one here, uh, there's no evidence behind this diet. It's, it's not beneficial in any way, and there's, there's just no proof to show that it's effective for preventing or, um, or fighting cancer. Okay? All right. More on the fad bandwagon, um, detox diet. So I'm sure um, everyone in the room here has either heard of detox diets or, or cleansing diets. Um, and the thought behind following these diets is that they will help, you know, improve overall health and, you know, remove cancer toxins from the body. I think that, I think that these diets are, are very appealing to people, you know, because we're going through, through difficult treatment. You know, it's, it's no, no wonder things like chemotherapy is hard on the body, absolutely. And I think people have the idea that, you know, if we're doing a cleanse, a detox, they're doing, they're doing something good for their body, okay? Um, and when I use the term detox diet, it's just kind of like a blanket term for a lot of different diets. But typically what they recommend is either, you know, period of fasting, so a period of time that we're not eating, and that can range from, you know, a few hours during the day to, you know, 24, 40 hours for some detox diets. Um, other ones will discourage you um, from eating certain foods or entire food groups. There's a big restrictive component of the diet. And then other ones will just encourage, you know, really, really large volumes of fluids like lemon water or herbal teas or freshly pressed juices. Um, so what we have to realize is the evidence does not show that following a detox diet will improve overall health or reduce cancer risk. So that's, that's number one. Um, 
And the second thing we really have to realize is that these diets are not without, you know, potential harm or side effects, okay? I think it depends, you know, definitely on how often we're doing these cleanses for and, you know, the period of time that we're following them for. But things that we can definitely see are definitely weight loss, especially if there's a big fasting component of the diet, uh, electrolyte imbalances, low blood sugars, Fatigue and increased weakness is, is a big one for a lot of people, depending how long we're following them for. If, they're, if we're avoiding certain food groups, we may definitely run into issues with vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So these are all red, red flags for me, right? If the, if the cons outweigh the pros of a diet, it's not something that I would, that I would ever recommend. Um, and we also have to realize this. Our body, our bodies its own detox machine, okay? We have lungs and we have kidneys and a liver and, and intestines. And these organs, part of their role is to flush waste from the body, okay? Our body is good at it. We don't have to worry about following any, any fad diet to help with that because it can, it can handle it on its own. I guess I should continue with the slides too. You start talking and then you forget there's a computer that you have to be hitting <laughs> So, yeah, just to recap, that's pretty much everything that I said. And also, a big thing I want to highlight is that all those side effects, you know, the potential side effects, that can absolutely, you know, disrupt our treatment. And, of course, if we're going, if we're actively going through treatment, we want to make sure that we complete our treatment as it's prescribed by our oncologist. We don't want to fool around with any wacky diets that can, um, that can cause any, any delays or, or, or disruptions at all. Okay, organic diets. I think this one here might be a little bit more controversial, but uh, hear me out. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the thought that eating organic food could um, prevent uh, or reduce the risk of cancer. So organic foods, I'm talking about organic produce, things like fruits and vegetables that are farmed, um, that are grown without the use of any artificial or synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. Okay, I think that organic foods have definitely gained popularity in recent years, and I think a big part of that is that people just perceive them as being, you know, the safer choice, more wholesome, and just overall healthier for us. Like I said, we're bringing it back to the evidence, um, everything science-based today. So the research that has been done, and they're comparing organic foods and conventionally grown foods, like regular produce that you find at the grocery store or supermarket. When we're comparing the two, nutritionally, the differences are so, so, so insignificant, we can, we can say that they are essentially of equal value. So what that means, if I had, you know, those strawberries on the table over there, if I had organic strawberries and conventionally grown strawberries. Nutritionally, if I'm looking at the nutrition breakdown, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, fiber, it's essentially the same. So I wouldn't want anyone to feel like they had to choose organic produce because it's a healthier choice, because that's, it's, uh, it's not the case. What we have to realize as well is just because a product is, you know, deemed or certified organic, there's always the possibility of contamination. So let's say I have an organic farm here and a conventional farm right beside. You know, we have air pollution, you no know, pesticides through groundwater. It's, it's a reality. So there, there definitely may be some still, you know, traces of pesticides on our unorganic products. I wouldn't want to discourage anyone from buying organic. I'd say it's, it's, a, it's a choice and it's a preference. There's no harm in it. The biggest downside that I see with it, though, is, is the cost. Organic is, is more expensive. Um, and oftentimes that's the barrier that stops people from consuming a good variety and enough produce in their diet is just they can't afford to buy everything organic. So they buy less of it. They buy it, you know, less often. And as a result of that, we're not getting the benefits of, you know, fruits and vegetables in our diet. Um, so I'd say if you, can, if you can afford organic and if that's, you know, an important choice for you personally, go for it. I wouldn't discourage anyone from doing it, um, but I wouldn't want anyone to feel like they had to choose organic products because it was nutritionally healthier or reduce the risk of cancer. That's, that's, the, that's the difference I just wanted to point out for that. Recap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the low bacteria diet. 
Um, now, this was a diet that um, were followed by immunocompromised patients, and the thought was that it would reduce the risk of infection. All right. <laughs> or not. <laughs> uh, so when I say immunocompromised patients, you know, those are individuals who have been, you know, have been told that their immune function has been compromised. So, you know, individuals who are going through um, cancer treatment, for example. Um, now, when we're looking at cancer itself and the treatment that we're going through, it's, it's of course, it's going to have, you know, somewhat of an impact on, on our immune function. And oftentimes what we see is our, our white blood cell count can drop and that could, you know, in, increase our risk of infection. So this diet here was, um, you know, invented, I guess, uh, as a way to, you know, with food, try and prevent the risk of infection from happening. Um, now, it's important to know that the low bacteria diet, also called the, the neutropenic diet, some of you may have heard, um, it restricts certain foods, so mainly fresh fruits and vegetables, which, which is very difficult, you know, it's a very difficult way of eating for, for people to follow. Um, now, when we look at the research that's been done and we've compared, you know, two groups of individuals, both diagnosed with cancer with decreased immune function, one group was, you know, consuming the low bacteria diet and the other group was just on a regular conventional diet. The rate of infection was the same in both groups. So that shows us that the, the diet wasn't, wasn't as effective as we had hoped it would be to reduce the risk of infection. And I would, I would hate for anyone to have to overly restrict their diet if it wasn't benefiting them in any way. Yeah. Then what about Cancer Care Ontario's mm -hmm. neutropenic diet page? So there, yeah, absolutely. So they, they do have a page on that. Um, it is still used for, for some individuals um, who are receiving stem cell transplants, but for, for most individuals, it, the evidence just isn't there to support its use. Well, can you be more specific in terms of, for example, absolute neutrophil count? And, and it seems like it's pretty clear about when that applies as related to... So I would say if it's been recommended by your oncologist, um, then then to follow it for however long they have recommended it for. Um, but when we're looking at, you know, the studies that have been done and the effectiveness of it, there's just not enough research to show us that this actually helps to reduce the risk of infection. And when we're looking at, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for, um, when you, you actually follow something, when you're um, compliant with the diet. It's very difficult to follow a diet that has no fresh fruits and vegetables in. It's 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 tough. It it really really is. Um, the the low bacteria diet or the neutropenic diet used to actually be a standard diet order that we had here at HSM. Um, we haven't used this diet for for quite a, a few years now because oncologists were saying, you know, I don't want my patients to be following an overly restricted diet. The evidence just really isn't there to show that it's that it's all that beneficial. What I would suggest though, instead of overly restricting your diet, definitely following safe food um, handling practices. So warm water, washing our hands with warm soap and water, and that's before we you know, touch any food, do any food preparation, eat anything. Um, so that itself is very, very helpful. Other things that we have to look at, making sure that we're not eating any food that's past the expiry date. Okay, so the yogurt was expired a week ago, throw it out, get yourself some more, don't don't play around with that stuff. <laughs> Not recommended, Tracy. <laughs> Um, other things, making sure that our meat is cooked properly. I wouldn't be going to an all-you-can-eat sushi buffet and, and playing around with, you know, raw, raw, raw fish or undercooked meats. Um, Cross-contamination is also a big one. So when we're looking at where we're storing our food in our fridge, is our, um, you know, our raw steak right on top of our fresh strawberries? We need to make sure that we're, you know, that we're separating things appropriate in the fridge to reduce any risk of cross-contamination. We want to be washing our fruits and vegetables properly. So that's essential. So those are, you know, those are the safe food handling methods that absolutely, I would recommend that to any of my patients who are going through cancer treatment um, because that itself is, is what, um, most helpful in reducing our risk of uh, infection when it comes to foodborne illness. 
Okay. Okay, so supplements. Can supplements help in the food in the fight against cancer? Now, when I talk about supplements, I'm talking about everything from vitamins to minerals to herbs to any plant product, really. Blanket term for, for all of that. Um, now, I think there's a perception that just because something is um, marketed as being natural or just because something can be purchased over the counter without a prescription, that it is automatically a safe product to take. And that's something that we have to realize is definitely not the case. Um, so when we're looking at prescription medication, you know, it's prescribed by a doctor. We have follow-up. We can ask questions to our pharmacist, for example. We know that there are side effects, but, you know, things are being monitored. The downside with these supplements is that oftentimes they're, they're self-prescribed. So you don't get the input from, you know, your pharmacist or your doctor or your dietitian for that matter, you know, advising you or warning you of any of those potential side effects. So it's something that we have to be cautious with because as we're going through treatment, we have to realize that there are absolutely negative side effects that can result from taking certain supplements. So, for example, um, there are some that can cause or there's a thought that it could cause um, conventional treatment to be less effective. So when we're looking at high doses of antioxidants, for example, so let's say vitamin C is an antioxidant. Um, if we're taking high doses of that, we have to look at what that could potentially be doing as we're going through treatment. So antioxidants help um, reduce the oxidative stress on our cells. It helps keep cells healthy. When we're going through treatment, you know, the purpose you know, of this treatment is to help you know, destroy these cancer cells. So by taking those high doses of antioxidants, can we actually be, you know, causing our treatment to be less effective? Those are things that we have to, you know, keep into consideration, all right? Um, if you are interested in, in taking a supplement or, you know, you're, you're wanting more information on them, there are some that, that can be taken, you know, with uh, safely, okay? It's just talking to the oncologist, talking to your pharmacist, your dietitian even, um, running it by them, saying, hey, I'm interested in taking this. What do you think? Okay, there's, there's actually a, there's a resource um, handout that I, that I created for, for all of you for, for a take home. And one of the websites on that handout is called Memorial Kettering Sloan. Um, so it's a great evidence-based website. So if you're looking for information on specific supplements, you know, I would, I would start there. Okay, there's a section for healthcare professionals and then there's a section for patients as well. So the vocabulary is a little bit different, you know, a little bit more straightforward, easy to understand, um, and it will uh, provide any information on potential interactions with treatment. So definitely a good resource to check out. Okay, so my last you know, misinformation, myth-busting topic are superfoods. So has anyone here of this heard of the term superfood? Blueberry. Yes. What else? <laughs> Hit me. Yes, kale, asparagus, quinoa, acai berries, goji berries. Yes. What do all these foods have in common, do you think? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I forgot to add that to my presentation. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, what, they, what they all have in common is they're all healthy foods. You know, there's no doubt about it. They're all awesome foods that I would recommend any of my patients to add into their, you know, regular, well-balanced diet. Um, by no means are they super or have superhero qualities. Um, and that's what they're marketed as, right? They're marketed as being these, these amazing single nutrient foods that, provide, you know, the, the ability to prevent or, or fight cancer, right? And we have to take that with a grain of salt. You know, we know they're healthy, but they have their limitations, right? Um, so it's realizing that we don't need to be focusing on large amount of single foods just because they're, you know, marketed as being extra, extra healthy. You know, all fruits and vegetables, you know, grain products, they're, they're good foods to incorporate in our diet. That, that's just, you know, balanced eating. Right, so I would I would hate for someone to kind of get caught up in the the superfood marketing scheme um, because that's that's really all it is at the end of the day. Uh, so making sure that we're focusing on balance, 
And I know balance isn't trendy and it's not as exciting and, and fun sounding as superfoods or, or a lot of these fad diets that come and go in, in, in passing years, but it's, it's what's tried and true. It's what the evidence is showing is what's most beneficial as we're going through treatment. That way there, we're not missing out on any important nutrients. We're, we're getting a good balance of, of everything. Okay. So I, I presented a lot of misconceptions, a lot of myths today, but what if, what if we're actually looking for, for good evidence-based information? Um, we'll look no further. <laughs> uh, so number one, if you are, you know, if you are experiencing any significant issues yourself, whether it's weight loss or symptoms or side effects from treatment that are, you know, causing you to have a poor, poor appetite or, or poor oral intake, then I would say absolutely you no know, ask to get an appointment with one of the dietitians here at the Cancer Center. Um, there's three out of four of us here in this room right now, so you can make an appointment with any, any one of us, either you know, talking to your primary nurse or your oncologist or, or even calling supportive care directly. You don't need a doctor's referral. If you're, if you're struggling, you, you give us a call and you let us know what your struggles are and, and when you'd like to book an appointment. But if you're looking for more just, you know, general information, uh, like I mentioned before, you know, quick Google search doesn't always provide the best info right off the, right off the bat. But if we know where to look, we can definitely get some, some really, really great information. So that's why I put together um, that handout that I think you can get at the, uh, at the, at the end of the table. Um, so the, the websites that I've provided are either cancer agency websites, uh, government websites or, or hospital websites. So we know that when we when we go on one of these websites here, we're, we're getting evidence-based, solid nutrition information. We don't have to to doubt our sources. You know, it's it's good stuff. All righty. So that is uh, that's pretty much it. That's uh, that's my part for today. <laughs> um, are there any any questions or anything that anyone would like to to bring up or comment on? Yeah might be a little bit like the sugar. Okay. Yeah. But what about the glutamate? So what's your specific question about it? Could people be avoiding things like tomatoes or MSG, things like that? So I know some people who do have MSG intolerance, you know, they get the restless leg, you know, the rapid heart rate. I would say that if you're having significant concerns after you consume foods with that, then, then I would restrict my intake. I would restrict my intake if you know, you weren't having any, any negative side effects from it. Um, and, that's, and that's what we have to realize. You know, you want to restrict your intake if you have an allergy or an intolerance. Aside from that, there's no real reason to specifically avoid um, any specific foods, really. Okay, you'll notice we have cookies and broccoli on the table back there, okay? There's a reason. It's the balance piece. Yes. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, we're good. All right, perfect. Well, it was a pleasure to, to participate today. I, I appreciate the turnout, like I said, um, and I hope to, you know, be involved in other education sessions, you know, down the road. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I just need to quickly load up yours. So I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Sandy Spoken by Christian. He's uh, new to February and new to Health Sciences Network, but uh, we've all grown to love him very quickly. Uh, he is going to present to us today on different uh, treatments, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to let him talk because he's awesome. I've already listened to him in the past, and uh, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to get an idea of uh, the uh, 
type of uh, cancers that we are dealing with. So this is supposed to be a leukemia lymphoma, correct? Okay, because this is a very vast area, and it's uh, unfair to really talk much about uh, this without making much sense. With, with, uh, with making much sense in an hour. So what I've tried to do is to sort of touch on topics and uh, try to have a common theme to things so that you can go home with some message. Uh, if you have any special question, you know, just stop me there and we can talk more. Um, a oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so we can talk about MDS. MDS is not included in this talk, but we can talk about MDS. It's a slightly kind of different uh, situation. Um, so I let's start with what, um, you know, what, um, where comes from, in blood cancers come from where. So um, this is how, uh, this is just sort of breakdown of cells that we have in our blood. And uh, I'm sure that you probably have read about this before, but all the blood cells come from bone marrow or spleen or thymus. These are the three organs that we have, um, or in liver and in children. Uh, but as you grow older, most of the things get um, restricted to either uh, spleen or bone marrow. That's where most of the cells are made. Um, and uh, we have um, a specific sort of uh, progression of maturation of cells starting from the bone marrow as they mature and come outside to uh, the blood as mature cells. And um, the, um, all these things start with a sort of mother cell, which is the pluripotent stem cell. And uh, they, are, they have the ability to differentiate into multiple kind of cells. They can go from one type to the other. They have plasticity. They can go from one type to uh, another. So most of the cells start from the bone marrow as a pluripotent stem cell. And from there, you have the lymphoid and myeloid. Um, and lymphomas generally tend to happen in the lymphoid uh, lineage. And myeloid, all the leukemias tend to happen um, in myeloid. And some of the leukemias also happen in the lymphoid lineage. And uh, from there, you have red cells, white cells, platelets, which are the um, direct maturation from the uh, myeloid component. And then you have a lymphoid, which makes the B cells and T cells. Um, among the lymphoid cells, if you have an infection, for example, um, if there are cells that go and fight the infection right away. And these cells make antibodies that fight infection. And some of them retire and become what we call mature plasma cells. They are like the guardians in the blood. And if you have the same infection later on, they start making antibodies without waiting. So they are the ones that give immediate fighting potential if you have the same infection later on. But when you get an infection for the first time, you will have that time before you develop immunity. But if you have to get it second time, these memory cells go back into action very quickly and they make antibodies and fight infection. So that's the whole principle of vaccination too. So when you do vaccination, what happens is that you create a bunch of memory cells which can go and fight infection later on if you have the same thing later on. So that's the uh, principle of uh, vaccination. Um, white cells tend to fight infection, among which you have the myeloid and lymphoid, both are called white cells. Myeloid tend to fight bacterial infection. Lymphoid tend to uh, fight viral infections more often. Um, white cell platelets tend to plug bleeding. So you have lots of bruises going on in your body all the time. There are micro abrasions inside the arteries and veins. Um, and if you don't have uh, platelets going and plugging these places, you tend to get bruises in multiple places all the time. And this is what happens in hemophiliacs because they don't have clotting factor. Um, even minor movement can cause sometimes muscle bleed and stuff like that. Um, so platelets go and help with uh, plugging bleeding. And hemoglobin is what supplies oxygen to the body. And if you look at uh, leukemia and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's very um, uh, easy to remember in two ways. All the, all the cancers that happen in the uh, early cells, which are typically inside the bone marrow, tend to be very aggressive. And they are the ones that are generally becoming leukemias. And in simple terms, leukemia don't wait for too long. They become very, um, you know, the patients tend to feel symptoms very quickly. You tend to get ill very quickly. And uh, uh, most of the leukemias may be childhood, adulthood. They all happen generally from bone marrow. And bone marrow is a place where you have the uh, um, very young cells. Um, and uh, or we call them blasts, and blasts are the cells that mature later on to become mature cells in the blood. So when things go wrong at the blast stage, they tend to be very aggressive, and uh, that's what leukemias are all about. So if it is myeloid blast, you get myeloid leukemia. If it's lymphoid blast, you get you know acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, both types are very aggressive. Um, as they come out of the bone marrow and go into blood, they first of all go into um, either spleen or lymph glands, what happens is that when they go in there, they will go through a process of selection. And where 
in, in the lymph gland, when they see an infection in the blood, for example, if the particular lymphocyte can recognize the uh, infection, it tends to grow inside. If the uh, lymphocyte cannot engage any bacteria it sees in the blood, it dies away. So there is a process of selection inside lymph glands, and uh, that's why lymph glands are very active. So there's a very um, um, active process going on lymph glands, and this is the, the ready reason why um, lymph gland is the next uh, likely place to de develop cancers, because that's where the uh, white cells are constantly being exposed to infection in the blood, and the ones that have the right receptor for the infection, they tend to grow. The ones who don't have, they die away. So there's a lot of chopping and changing of genetics inside lymph glands, and it's a very active place. And most of the lymphomas tend to happen inside lymph glands. And uh, again, within the lymph glands, um, there are different types of uh, lymphomas, and you can look at them. You know, there are free germinal center. Germinal center is a place where they meet the antibody, the infection. Okay, so they go through the blood and go into the, uh, germ you know, before the germinal center, they go inside germinal center, they see infection, they react or they die, and they come out of uh, lymph glands, and then they become memory cells in the blood as plasma cells. So um, different cancers have different phase in the differentiation that they go into. So it's very easy in that sense to say that anything that comes from the bone marrow tends to be more aggressive, leukemia. The ones that are going into the lymph glands tend to be more indolent, generally. There are some exceptions, like aggressive basal lymphomas, um, myeloma, some types are very aggressive. Uh, but in general, the cancers that come out of lymph, uh, lymph glands typically tend to be slightly more slow-growing. And, uh, um, you know, you have the indolent and the uh, aggressive lymphomas within that group. But generally, they are the ones where sometimes treatment is not needed, and you can just observe them. And it's not generalization, but, you know, we'll talk more about it as we go along. If you look at the incidence of all new cancers in Canada in 2016, and this holds true for wherever you go in the world, uh, most of the cancers that we see are lymphoma in uh, wherever you go. That's the most common condition. And of the lymphoma, the most common is basal non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and uh, then comes leukemia. Then you have the rarer conditions like, such as myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS. Myeloma is 12%. Uh, PV stands for polycythemia vera, where there is a condition where the red cells tend to grow. It's not a cancer, but there is too much of red cells. You know, hemoglobin is often 20, 21. You tend to have problems from that thick blood. You know, you tend to have dizziness sometimes because blood is too thick. Um, ET is essentially thrombocytosis, where, again, the platelets go too high and your blood tends to clot very easily. Um, P or PT is uh, primary thrombocytosis, same thing. Myelofibrosis is another condition, which all form the same kind of polycythemia, ET, myelofibrosis. They all form under one group called myeloprolific disorder. Uh, they are not like acute leukemia where you, you know, die very quickly, but they all have profound uh, effects on your body, and you've got to manage them. Uh, we have a big number of patients with uh, this group. Generally, tends to happen in older population, typically about 70, 75. And the good thing is that most of the times you can just observe them or, you know, do the right treatment, like taking blood out is one treatment. You, you know, we detect them. You remove half a liter every month or two months, and, you know, you can go on for many years like that. Um, some patients need a small dose of chemotherapy to keep the platelet counts low. But generally speaking, the myeloprolific disorder, PV, ET, and myelofibrosis tend not to cause a lot of problems to most people. Um, the ones that we treatment mostly are certain patients of lymphoma, most leukemia, and MDS and myeloma, they all need treatment for sure. Whereas the other ones can be observed for a short while and sometimes even longer, and they can go without much treatment. So I'm sure that, you know, you probably all have Googled up and uh, found, found out various risk factors for cancers. Unfortunately, there's nothing different that stands up for lymphoid cancer. They are the same as uh, for lung cancer or for, you know, colon cancer, breast cancer. They're all the same thing. It's just that the... Uh, when the changes happen in bone marrow, you tend to get lymphoma leukemia, whereas if it happens in uh, lung, for example, you get lung cancer. So there isn't anything that is particularly standing out um, in terms of, um, you know, chemicals that would put you at risk. But having said that, um, HIV uh, is a, a problem where you tend to get more lymphoma because there's a lot of viruses that tend to go along with HIV infection, and uh, they tend to prefer lymphoid problems, so EBV virus. Um, or um, uh, Epstein Barr virus, these are all, sorry, uh, or cytomegalovirus, these are all viruses that are typically seen in immunocompromised HIV patients. So they tend to prefer 
lymphoid disorder, but smoking or, you know, working in paint factory, benzene, or, you know, in mines, for example. You know, I've seen people getting lung cancer. They can get lymphoma, all kinds of things. Likewise, you know, radiation, they're all, you know, general kind of risk factors for all kinds of cancers. And again, symptoms of blood cancer are nonspecific. You know, they don't have any specific um, um, signs, but lumps and bumps are typically common in lymphoma. So lymph glands are there in different parts of the body, and typically in your neck, um, armpit, in your groin, um, other places where you see normally lymph glands, they don't come up in uh, big numbers normally. They're, they're not big in size. In children, for example, if you have a glandular fever, you can see that they're not, I mean, if, you're, if you have children, you can actually feel their neck, and sometimes they have lymph glands in the neck easily, you can feel them. That's because children are like, you know, they have no immune system. They are constantly seeing, uh, you know, infections and reacting to them. And uh, oftentimes their glands can be big, but it's not anything to worry about. You know, they are just in the process of uh, developing their memory cells because that's what, you know, they do when you grow up. You have, you know, infection, your body gets used to seeing them. Sometimes they grow because they have seen a new infection, they get excited. But, uh, you know, oftentimes they go down and they, you know, they, they develop memory cells and immune cells for future. So if you see a lump that is not going away um, after a flu or whatever it is, and it's, you know, there for, you know, two mu you know one month, two months, that would be the time to sort of think about it, okay? Or if it's typically painful, um, then you need to worry about it too. Um, so if you have a lump, observe it first and see if it is, um, you know, size of it, number of it. Uh, but typically anything that is related with increasing size, you know, see a doctor or uh, get a biopsy. That's what uh, I would do. Recurrent infection is another sign of it because when you have anything to do with uh, blood cancer, infection, immunity goes down. And um, sometimes they get recurrent throat infection, recurrent chest infection, you know, head and sinus infection. These are all signs of, uh, again, uh, low immunity. Um, again, you cannot, you know, that's not, uh, common just for blood cancer, but these are all things that would say that your immunity is low. And these are all things that, again, weight loss, tiredness, fever, these are all very common symptoms. So, you know, it's very hard to really pinpoint anything to um, specifically blood cancer, but these are all very signs for all kinds of cancers, really. In the previous slide, uh, the risk factors, which factors were, you know, I think it's not very <laughs> Yeah. Were you expecting anything below T? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually from um, CDC, which is the uh, Center for Disease Control website, uh, because I tried to look for something and create it myself, but this is quite nicely uh, written down, so I just took it from there. Okay, so I'll talk. Start talking about leukemia, which uh, I don't know whether anybody has gone through treatment for leukemia. Um, yes, yeah, I know. Um, so leukemia is um, it falls in the first group where the uh, cancer is actually happening in the bone marrow, and uh, there are two types of leukemia, and the acute leukemia tends to happen inside bone marrow. Chronic leukemia is slightly different. Um, again, it's very hard to uh, put them both in the same place, but. Uh, Leukemia, I'm talking of here is, um, you know, acute leukemia for specifically because that's more important, more uh, challenging to treat. Um, so there are two types, acute and chronic. Acute comes on very quickly, doesn't hang around. You get sick very quickly. If you don't get treated, you die within generally six months sort of thing. Chronic leukemia, oftentimes you don't even pick it up because um, you don't feel much different um, unless the doctor does a blood test or you have a new problem, you go and do a blood test. Sometimes you so see that your white cells are high. And then there's a raft of blood tests. Finally, somebody says it's chronic leukemia. No need to do anything. Some uh, chronic leukemias need treatment, uh, such as a chronic myeloid leukemia, which is a different condition altogether. But uh, chronic lymphoid leukemia, which is very common in the community, if you do blood tests on 100 people, probably four or five of them may have CLL. We call it CLL. Um, they would probably never know that they had CLL, and they would leave and you know, die without ever knowing that they had CLL. Um, so oftentimes, even if you find such patients, we don't treat them, we just observe them. Um, whereas acute leukemia is very clear, you know, the decline is very quick, they start feeling very ill, and uh, they generally come to hospital within sort of months to two months, you know, um, or even shorter than that. Um, so, as I said before, most of the acute leukemias need fairly intensive chemotherapy because the cells are growing very rapidly, 
And um, if you don't do intensive chemo, um, we don't, we can't do very much generally. Okay. So um, acute leukemia, um, there are two types, myeloid and lymphoid. Both are somewhat similar in the uh, philosophy of treatment. You give them intensive chemotherapy, but there is some differences into, uh, as to how we do manage them later on after the intensive chemotherapy. So the philosophy of treatment is you go with intensive chemo, and the aim of treatment is to uh, bring what we call a remission, where the cancer cells have vanished from the bone marrow, or at least into our eyes, they've gone away. But um, we know that that's just the tip of the iceberg. And generally, if you don't uh, maintain it or do more treatment, they will, go, you know, they will come back. So the first phase of treatment is intensive chemotherapy. And depending on what condition we are dealing with, if it's a um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, sometimes we recommend uh, transplant, whereas some of the other acute myeloid leukemias with very bad chromosome changes, where there's genetic changes in the bone marrow, again, we would recommend bone marrow transplant. Um, and um, bone marrow transplant is, again, a very tricky subject because um, it's fairly toxic. And... Um, we don't do that for very elderly patients. When I say that, typically about 70, we don't do transplant. Um, 15 years ago, people about the age of 45 would, would not be offered transplant, but now we know that transplant has become much safer, and we can do transplant for certain types of leukemia, even if they are age 50, you know, 65, 70, provided their organ function like heart and kidney function, everything is good, we can consider a transplant. And there is a special kind of transplant called reducing density transplant where we don't use a lot of chemotherapy, but we tweak the immune system to uh, somehow um, get the donor cancer cells to attack the cancer cells rather than using the chemotherapy to kill the cancer cells. Um, whereas in the conventional transplant, we use a lot of heavy dose chemotherapy and the risk of death is close to 20% just from the uh, transplant. Whereas with the uh, reduced density transplant, the mortality is close to 10%. Um, so there has been a lot of progress, you know, improvement made in that side. But acute leukemia, we still see, um, you know, about two a month uh, in Sudbury. We get patients from Sault Ste. Marie and all those places come to us. We give the other ones to treat. Uh, and we send patients from here to Ottawa for allergen and transplant. Um, we don't do transplant where we give somebody else's donor stem cells. They go to Ottawa. Um, there's a second kind of transplant where we use your own stem cell, and that's called autologous transplant, which is done for myeloma and certain types of lymphoma. We do that in Sudbury. But for leukemia, we don't do that. We always get somebody else's uh, stem cell for transplant. Chronic leukemia, as I said, is a slow-growing tumor and uh, oftentimes known, uh, doesn't need treatment. Um, chronic myeloid leukemia is an exception where if you don't treat, generally people will, uh, uh, will feel the difference very quickly and can change to acute leukemia. So that's called transformation from CML to uh, blastitis, which is an, uh, it's like an acute leukemia form of CML. So CML is an exception, but chronic lymphocytic leukemia is a condition where you can actually observe them for many years without needing treatment. So, am I going too fast? No? Okay, feel free to stop because it's such a vast subject that I'm just jumping like a kangaroo from one to another. Okay? Feel free to stop. Um, I wanted to end with a good note, so I've got some good slides at the end for talking about, you know, how we are making progress because this is all grim news. We don't want this. So we want to see good news, right? Um, so, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the most common thing that we treat. Um, and of the non hodgkins lymphoma, they all, you know, as I showed in my previous picture, they happen in lymph glands generally, and they're all to do with mature B cells and T cells rather than the immature cells, and they are less aggressive generally, um, and there are two types, the B cell and T cell, uh, because they, we have two types of lymph cells, B and T. B is the most common in this part of the world. If you go to uh, Asia, um, there's a lot of T cell lymphoma. Uh, but in, um, in Canada, there's plenty of B cell, and that's the most common in the Western world. Um, most of the uh, lymphomas tend to be um, not so aggressive uh, in the sense that we can sit on them for a month or two. Some of them don't need, uh, need any treatment. Follicular lymphoma is a common non-aggressive lymphoma, by far the most common uh, lymphoma that we see on a daily basis. And the standard um, investigations would be CAT scan, blood test examination, see how they are doing. If the cancer is not affecting their body function, we probably would not treat them. We would just observe them. Um, there are certain other non-aggressive lymphomas like mantle cell lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma. Mantle cell is slightly different, so you have to treat marginal zone lymphoma. They're all based on how they come or where they start inside the lymph gland, by the way. 
So um, if you go back to this picture, all the cancers that happen around, this is the um, mandrosome. So cancers that happen where this area expands is mandrosome lymphoma. Marginal is uh, outside of that. Um, and uh, anything that is inside here typically happens to be more aggressive or follicular lymphoma, which are not very aggressive. So from inside this germinal center, you can get either follicular lymphoma or aggressive diffuse large piece of lymphoma. Um, aggressive lymphoma, diffuse large piece of need treatment. Follicular lymphoma oftentimes do not need treatment. Okay. So um, in, uh, in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the uh, philosophy is that you treat them with chemotherapy, and generally we don't do transplant in the first instance. Um, you give them good treatment, and generally the expectation is that they will do very well. And this is the uh, sort of um, survival from, again, the Female Lymphoma Society, um, which uh, looks at the survival uh, over many years of um, the various lymphomas that we treat. So on the uh, right side, red um, is the uh, recent 2006-2008, left side is 92-94. The reason why we're comparing two different eras is because we've had some significant changes in treatment in the last sort of 10 years. We've had new drugs coming out um, which um, attack cancer in a totally different way. We'll talk about it later. But uh, you can see that some of them have done very well with the new drugs, whereas some of them have not done very well, and these are the challenges that we have. Um, so Hodgkin's lymphoma is a lymphoma typically of younger people. And so, you know, there's a band between age 30 to 40 when they tend to get it, younger people. Um, they present with lump in the neck. Um, oftentimes they have it for months before they come to doctors because they don't have any symptoms from it. Only when it becomes so big, or sometimes when they are pregnant, after, right after the um, childbirth, it comes out. Because we know that during pregnancy, these things can become more prominent. Um, even before we had any new drugs, Hodgkin's lymphoma is one disease where treatment has been very effective. and uh, long-term cure close to 80% in most people. But uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we've made significant progress. In the uh, 90s, we didn't have good drugs, but in the last 10 years, we've had new drugs um, coming out, which are looking at new models of healing cancer, and we've had a significant improvement. Um, and leukemia, to some extent, not as impressive, because unlike in lymphoma, we haven't had major breakthrough in cancer, in you know, treatment of leukemia. We are still using the same old drugs that we had in 1970s. And, um, you know, whatever drugs have been trialed, no major breakthrough in real change in the way, um, you know, outcomes have been changed. We've used transplant and chemotherapy since 1980s in leukemia. And uh, even to date, we really don't have anything different to treat, at least that is funded and available in Canada. If you go to clinical trial centers in the U.S. or in Toronto or other places, there are clinical trials, but none of them have really been shown to be of effect in routine practice. So leukemia is still an area where, you know, we could do with better drugs. Whereas with lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, there's been tremendous improvement. Myeloma is another one where there has been an explosion of drugs. So um, 20 years ago, myeloma, nobody wanted to be a myeloma doctor. We didn't have any good drugs. So the standard statement is we treat with what we have. Most people didn't make it beyond three years. The outcome was dismal. But in the last 10 years, we've had an explosion of new drugs such that everybody wants to be a myeloma doctor now, including me. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so, um, so, you know, not every area of uh, blood cancer has been lucky to have good drugs. And leukemia is one where we're still struggling, whereas we have had significant improvements in other um, areas. So what do we do for, um, for you know, in, as investigators for new cancers? Uh, you know, blood tests, we do a lymph node biopsy. So if there's a lump, uh, we always want to do a proper biopsy. So the doctors might say, well, let's do a needle biopsy. And needle biopsy is only a tiny piece of tissue from my, they use a small needle and go in and take a biopsy. But all of needs a lot of tissue to really say what it is, because all those things really matter. Uh, you know, when pathologists have to, they really have to give us a diagnosis and we hang our hat on their diagnosis to make a treatment. It can, you know, a slight change here will have a profound effect later on in the, down the road in treatment. So, you know, oftentimes when patients come to us, you know, uh, I can remember a patient who's um, about age 40 from somewhere up north. He had three baths by the time he came here. Unfortunately, every single time, he was a needle biopsy, a sliver of tissue, pathologists couldn't really call it. And after coming here, the poor child was frustrated. 
and he was in pain. But I didn't have a choice. We had to do another biopsy again, you know. Um, and finally, we got it sorted out. He's doing well now. But um, oftentimes, we may tell you again that we need a second biopsy, and that's because the things that we do are not pleasant. We want to be really sure that what we're doing is really right. And again, the pathology pathologists can actually change the diagnosis from one to another completely based on a different tissue. So, you know, they, they will change from A to B when they see, a, you know, better tissue. So for them, um, you know, they need more tissue, and for us it's vitally important. So, you know, lymph node biopsy, proper tissue, oftentimes we ask for the whole lymph node to be taken out if possible. If not, at least with generous excision biopsy where, um, you know, insertion biopsy will take a big chunk of lymph node out uh, because that's what pathologists want, and, you know, only with a good diagnosis we can start treatment. Oftentimes, we do a bone marrow biopsy, and uh, it's a part of staging test. So when we have a cancer, the first step is to establish that you have a cancer. The second step is to see to what level you have it in the body. Uh, so that is called staging. So that's where a CAT scan comes. We look at the whole body. Sometimes we do a PET scan, which is where we um, look at a different way of looking at cancer. So a CAT scan can tell you whether something is big or small, whereas the PET scan can tell you whether uh, a big lymph node is actually actually cancerous or not. Because sometimes what happens is that you have a lymph gland, which is big, but uh, it may not be cancerous. It may be scar tissue, for example. And a, PET, a CAT scan cannot tell what's going on inside a gland. It can just tell you something is big or small. Whereas a PET scan can actually tell you whether it is metabolically active. They give radioactive glucose into the uh, body, and cancer cells take up um, glucose very actively. And they do a scan. So if there's anything that is actually taking up glucose, it will be seen as uh, lighting up in the scan. So that helps with a lot of information that a CAT scan cannot tell. So, you know, most of our lymphomas these days would go for a PET scan. Unfortunately, our PET scan is still not ready yet, uh, probably later this year or early part of next year. But most patients go to uh, Mississauga uh, or Thunder Bay to get a PET scan. What are your thoughts on um, I mean, if you have the money, no problem. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure, it, you know, the problem with all these things is that, you know, we call it number needed to treat, you know. So anything to become a prevalent screening test, for example, you need to have sufficient incidence of a cancer in the community and, and the test to be supple enough to pick up these things. And that's why pap smear and mammogram became prevalent because we know that breast cancer is very common, cervical cancer is very common, and the tests we use to pick them up are fairly robust, yes or no answer. But the problem with PET scan is that, you know, what's the incidence of lymphoma? If you look at the whole cancers in Canada, um, blood cancer is probably the uh, fifth or sixth in terms of, you know, prior in a problem. So um, are we going to pick up, you know, how many PET scans do you need to do in a 1,000 people to pick up one person with cancer? Is the province going to fund it? The answer is no. Very likely no. So if you have a private insurance and, uh, you know, it could well be that in 10 years down the road, you don't even need a PET scan because we know that now we have liquid biopsy where you do a blood test and you can tell you whether you have cervical cancer, prostate cancer, because very early on, we know that cancer DNA is released into blood. And uh, you can actually use PCR techniques to pick up these things. So, so in 10 years time, just with a urine sample, you can say whether you have breast or prostate or other things. So things are, technology is already evolving in that direction. Okay, but whether a province will fund it is a different question. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, we'll also do a number of tests called molecular tests, which are uh, to look at the genetic type of cancer and all that. So uh, these take, uh, tests typically take months to come back or weeks to months, and um, uh, but they don't oftentimes, you know, uh, need, we don't need that information to start treatment. There's most of these things are prognostic. They will tell you how you are likely to fare in the long run. So oftentimes when we have a diagnosis and there's an urgency to start treatment, we can start treatment and this information will come in later on and, you know, make our prognosis model and everything better. But we don't need them oftentimes to the start of uh, treatment. So one other important myth, just like the myth that we were talking earlier, um, every different cancer is different, okay? And um, breast cancer, for example, you know, lung cancer, so when you're thinking of, uh, you know, somebody's talking to you about cancer staging in lymphoma, please don't think of it as uh, same as, you know, breast cancer or, you know, lung cancer. They are totally different. Their implications are totally different, for example. You know, for 
somebody with lymphoma, stage four, stage three, hardly any difference in terms of outcome with the drugs that we have these days. We have good drugs. Whereas that may be different for, you know, lung cancer, for example. So, you know, you cannot compare staging between different cancers. In the same note, um, you know, again, when you have people with cancer among family, it's, again, very important to understand what kind of cancer they have and what stage they are in before you make decisions on your own treatment. Because oftentimes you make decisions based on personal experience of somebody else who may have had a different cancer and may have been in a different health state, you know, state altogether. So all these things are quite relevant. And, you know, you can't compare with an aunt who had a cancer in 1980s uh, because, you know, obviously during those times, the class were all hugging the bottom in terms of survival. We are doing much better than that these days. Um, so this is just a visual model um, of treatment. And this is not a generalization. This is something that I just made so that you get an idea how we think. Um, so this is not the model for leukemia. Leukemia is different. In leukemia, the first instance, the best instance, we want to grab that instance and do the best treatment at that time. So in acute leukemia, once you have leukemia, you give chemotherapy, you respond to treatment. After that, you go for transplant if possible. If you don't go for transplant because of health reasons, that's a different story. But in lymphoma, that's not the case. Oftentimes, we do not do transplant at the beginning because we know that the drugs are good enough. And uh, oftentimes, you can live with lymphoma, for example. So many of the low-grade, non-aggressive, non hodgkins lymphoma, we don't even treat them because we think that the treatment is going to be more toxic than the lymphoma itself. So, you know, we just observe and closely monitor every three months, et cetera. Um, even if we have to treat them, because of the drugs that we have right now, you know, once we treat, once we know that things have gotten better with a scan, we do a scan after three months of starting treatment, typically one, six months after starting treatment. And based on that, we can look at how the response has been. We can, you know, we can call them complete response, partial response, or no response or progressive disease. And depending on the uh, response these days, most of the treatments do have good response because they have good drugs. Um, you would just go from there to either stopping treatment or what we call maintenance. Uh, what is maintenance? Maintenance is one where you tend to give a low dose chemotherapy for a longer time so that it doesn't come back very quickly. So we try to prevent the progression of the disease. Um, so quality of life is maintained. So that's the other important thing. You know, we don't want to wreck the quality of life for, you know, compromising. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that quality of life is important. You know, there's no point killing your cancer, but at the same time, you know, ruining your quality of life. So the, the balance has to be very important. So um, most of the maintenance treatments are meant to uh, give you, you know, good quality of life before it comes back again. So we are trying to prolong it so that, you know, you can leave and function, work, and make money or whatnot till it comes back again, okay? We know that any cancer, the first 10 years from the diagnosis is the best time when you're most productive and most likely to contribute to yourself and to family and all the rest of it. So we want to maintain that. So maintenance and things like that, um, only now we can talk about it because 10 years ago we didn't have maintenance, but now we know that many drugs can be used as maintenance just to maintain the uh, good quality of life. Um, Towards the uh, you know, second half after 10 years, it becomes challenging because then you have more age is more advanced, you have more comorbidities, the cancer tends to be more aggressive, then you're looking at more harsh treatments and it becomes reasonable. But at the beginning, when you are more productive, you want to give more time to your family and your work and things like that. Any questions? No? I don't know. It's, is it confusing? No? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so myeloma is my personal child. I like myeloma. I've done myeloma for the last 10 years or so. So you may find a few extra sites on myeloma, but, you know, feel free to stop and ask me to, you know, skip on. So myeloma is a uh, weird disease. It's a cancer of bone marrow, but it behaves differently. Um, it tends to um, um, destroy bone, um, unlike leukemia, which, you know, it doesn't destroy bone. Myeloma tends to destroy bone. People tend to get fracture tend to get a kidney problems, heart problems, a variety of problems that leukemia and other things do not do, um, and yet it's an uncommon disease. Um, but the beauty of this disease is that it's a, it's a thing like cancer and um, cervical cancer. There's a long running period before it becomes manifest uh, in most patients. So there is that period where people live with it and, never, it, and do not know that they have it. Um, so that condition is called MGAS. Uh, it's a preface into becoming myeloma. 
not everybody would end up close to myeloma. The risk of progression is about 1% per year. And the incidence of MGAS is about, um, you know, 5% in the age of, above the age of 60. So if you did blood tests on 100 people in Sudbury above the age of 60, 5% of them will have this protein in the blood starting point, but only a small number of these people will have a knee treatment or even come to know that they have this problem because, you know, doctors don't do routine blood tests for it. Um, unless you are a blood donor, for example, you go and do a blood test and generally blood donors need to have blood tests done every time they go for donation. Sometimes you find that the protein is a bit high, get sent for blood tests. That's the only time people tend to pick up these things. Otherwise, you know, we don't know about this celiacal myeloma. Um, and um, as I said, you know, the incidence is very low and, you know, it's about 5% incidence of the, the precursor condition. Um, and the risk of progression, again, is very low. It's only 1% per year. So if you're age 50 and you have MDAS, you have a 20% chance of becoming myeloma by the age of 70. So it's 1% per year. So it's not, again, very high. Even among that group, there are some people who are more likely to progress because of a certain type of MDAS, and some groups who are less likely to progress to MDAS, uh, to myeloma. Um, it has multiple manifestations. Um, most commonly, it can damage your bones, so oftentimes spine fracture, you know, hip fracture. Um, sometimes they have rib fracture. They have a cough. They just need sudden pain in the chest because you, you're fractured near it. Um, it tends to eat into bones and uh, make your the bones thin. Um, likewise, it can also cause problems with kidneys and other problems. Unfortunately, the symptoms of myeloma are also very similar to the other things that I mentioned, you know, tiredness. Uh, one thing, though, that is very common in myeloma, low back pain. So if you have a back pain that is not going away, uh, you know, and you see that you sprain or whatnot, get a doctor, you know, and you're seeing doctors multiple times, no change. I would get an X-ray done, or ask the doctor at least to get an X-ray done. Uh, sometimes, uh, if the doctor is uh, kind of keen, they would do a blood test and look for um, signs of myeloma. But again, you know, it's entirely dependent on the doctor, really. So, uh, if you have a pain that is not going away, typically back pain, you know, you got to go and see a doctor and get a blood check done, get an X-ray done, um, just to rule out uh, any you know, thin, uh, thinning a bone. Uh, this is all fancy x-rays. If you want to see how x-rays look of skull, people with uh, myeloma. So this is called pepper pot skull. So you can see all the holes here. All the holes here. These are all areas that are thinned out because of myeloma. We don't use this anymore. These are all kind of archived pictures. You really have to go to Google and uh, be a deep web to get these pictures. Uh, no, we don't need them anymore. We use CT scan and MRI to pick up these things now. Uh, but these are all the initial kind of uh, classical features of myeloma. And um, so when somebody gets back pain, they go to the doctor, the doctor gives them Advil. You take a ton load of Advil. You don't drink very much because you're in pain all the time, bed rest. So by the time, doc, you know, you come to hospital, you have a kidney problem because you're not drinking well. Advil has caused kidney damage on top of it. And uh, the bone is da damaged and a lot of calcium comes out. A lot of things come out from the cal bone, high calcium. So this is the uh, emergency situation where you have a new myeloma in emergency where there is, you know, kidney damage because of painkillers, dehydration, and oftentimes the myeloma itself can cause kidney damage. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we see a small fraction, you know, of our patients still getting it. In, in real world, nobody should be getting it because the doctor should be well aware of it. Uh, but... Um, one important thing that for you to be aware of would be, you know, if you have something like a back pain that is not going away, instead of just taking pills and addressing that, you know, in a purely mechanical basis, you get it investigated and make sure that you don't have uh, anything, you know, lurking behind, which is more serious. And the problem with the kidneys is that, you know, once the kidney is damaged, they don't recover very fast and uh, the recovery potential of kidneys is not great. So um, uh, fortunately with the new drug that we have for myeloma, we can recover some of the kidney function, but I've seen a good number of patients ending up in dialysis and things like that, because once you pass the point where kidneys can recover, you know, then it, it becomes difficult. So, um, yeah, so most patients would get all these things. We do a bone marrow biopsy. These days we use MRI scans a lot, kidney function, blood tests, et cetera. And um, the treatment is, again, based on how young, uh, young you are. Um, and, you know, being young is a moving target again because um, um, we have very fit 70-year-olds um, or a fit, unfit 50-year-olds. So, you know, um, what matters is how physiologically fit you are. 
and not new, you know, numerically fit you are. So um, there's also another growing saying that uh, the, the older the doctor, you know, the more transplant eligible you are. So if you're 70 <laughs> and a doctor said, oh, sure you are transplant eligible, right? So, you know, uh, but that's not the case. But what, the side of it is that generally speaking, it's become more and more safer now to do transplant. It's become more and more safer now to do things because we know that, you know, we have better drugs, better nursing care, better access to antibiotics, better, you know, dietary support, all kinds of things are coming up. It's a, you know, it's a multi-team effort. And I think there's been significant improvement in all these things that now we can talk about these things, you know, intensive chemotherapy to elderly patients and still pull it off without significant toxicity and mortality. So, you know, we couldn't have done this, you know, 10 years ago. You know, there was a cutoff for age of 60 beyond which they wouldn't be transplanted. But now, routinely, 70, 71, 72, you know, we only have to look at eyeball them. We don't even need a scan because somebody is able to come a couple of, uh, you know, flight of stairs up without getting breathless. You know, you're fit for transplant. You know, that's all you need. You don't need an echo. You don't need a lung function, but you do them in reality. But, you know, the bottom line is that that's what we look for. We want somebody who's able to do normal activities. You know, it's as simple as that. So if you're fit and able to go for transplant, we'll give them chemotherapy. Then we do stem cell harvest, transplantation. And after that, maintenance. Maintenance, again, we give pills to keep it under control. Um, if you are not a transplant candidate because you are unfit for whatever reason, we give them chemotherapy. And the only difference is that we don't do transplant. The rest of the philosophy is the same. You know, you want to keep their first honeymoon as the best honeymoon for the longest period. Um, so we do maintenance of different types during that time, try to keep them active and, um, um, you know, productive uh, with their work and stuff like that. So um, I just wanted to now go to the next phase, which is, you know, how chemotherapy and things are working around, uh, you know, with the new drugs. Um, traditionally, we only had chemotherapy, bunker busters. They would kill good and bad cells together, leave a lot of side effects, you know, losing hair, et cetera, et cetera. But now we have novel agents. Novel agents are magic bullets. Um, what they look for is they try to target cancer cells. They look for specific pathways that cancer cells use to survive. Um, and uh, the benefit of using that is that generally they can complement very well with uh, the chemotherapy we use, um, so that chemotherapy kills. Sometimes the cancer cells have some mutations that make them resistant to chemotherapy, and you go with the novel agent, and you try to cover that angle. So you're trying to come from different angles to try to address the same problem and trying to uh, reduce the incidence of resistance and cancer cell escaping. Um, and uh, most of the... Uh, cancers, including lung cancer, breast cancer, you know, prostate, um, have all benefited from novel agents because there have been a, a few good drugs that have done in the last uh, four, four, four or five years. That has really changed the way we treat um, all these cancers. But blood cancer is one area where there has been an explosion of drugs that no other cancer has seen. And um, for, for that reason, there's been a lot of money from Big Pharma put into clinical trials and things like that, trying to explore um, new angles in treating. And partly it's also driven by the fact that um, the outcome has not been great for certain cancers. For example, myeloma. If you had looked at a treatment for myeloma 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had this treatment called Bortezomib. It's a new drug which was approved about 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. And uh, this drug, Revlimid, again, wasn't approved. People would get Melphalan, Fred, Thalidomide, which is a very old combination. It's been around for probably 20, 30 years. It hasn't changed much. Um, it had its limitations, both side effects-wise and efficacy-wise. So the first new drug that came out from myeloma was Bortezomib, and this is a novel agent. It targets a specific pathway in cancer cells that cancer cells use to escape or to survive. So likewise, Revlimid is a newer, uh, lenalidomide is a newer drug of thalidomide with much reduced side effects and acting differently. So with all the things, we've had significant improvement in myeloma. So this is a comparison of uh, survival of myeloma in the uh, um, 90s, where we did have uh, uh, Valcade or Bortezomib, and the most recent one. You can see that um, the average, I don't know whether you can see it. This is 30, this is 45, this is 60. So that's median survival in months. You know, so if you had the stage three myeloma, your median survival is typically 30 months. Whereas if you had stage two, 45 months, the best case, 60 months, you know, that's five years. But come, you know, fast over 10, 15 years, the best case scenario, you know, we haven't even reached the median survival. So their survival is so good, they're doing very, very well, you know. 
Um, the effects for the, uh, the bad group, the third uh, RISS3, is not as good as the uh, stage one. I think the stage one has benefited the most with the improvement in treatment, but they are still doing much better than what they would have done many years ago. So there are some changes that we are seeing now, so much so that you know some patients with myeloma, for example, is almost becoming like hypertension. You take this pill and you live for a long time. And, uh, um, sorry, so if we're jumping a slide, let me see. So I just wanted to say, you know, talk about the other condition called chronic myeloid leukemia, which is another condition that we have. Um, if you look at the graph here, this is survival in 1965, and this is the survival in, uh, in the 2000s, you know. You can see the difference of how things have changed in, in just a span of 40 years. So. This is the poster child of novel agents. You know, it's a pill that you take, like your, um, you know, Tylenol, for example. You take it for life, and there's a good chance, a 90% chance, that after 10 years, you're still going to be alive without any problem from this disease. You know, so um, what happens in, um, in this PML disease is that um, there's a particular translocation in the, in the chromosome called translocation 922, and uh, that makes a particular signal go inside the cell to make them grow faster, okay? And so what they did was to um, find a drug which has very similar activity or looks similar to this particular molecule and go and block it. So that's all they had to do. And with that, you're suddenly looking at survival, which is, you know, completely different. It's a cure. Almost 95% of people are alive at 10 years without disease. Um, so this is the sort of thing that we're looking at now in uh, lymphoma. Likewise, this is the uh, development of drug in lymphoma therapy. So back in 1942, nitrogen mustard, which is like a crude oil, but we don't even use it anymore. Um, and these are the different time points where which, you know, we've had significant improvement. In 1997, a drug called rituximab got approved in uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We use it routinely now. So with that, about 60% of patients with aggressive lethal lymphoma are now cured. Beyond five years, they are alive and well with our disease. Um, in 2011, a new drug called Brentaxima was approved for Hodgkin. Hodgkin is already a good disease, as I showed you before. About 80% to 85% are you know, alive in, in, in remission five years after diagnosis. But the ones who fail the first treatment, they have very poor outcomes. So they didn't have anything. So this drug was approved in uh, 2011, and it's approved in province as well. Um, it's meant for people who are failing the first-line treatment. They need relaxed treatment. Reduction was approved. And uh, in 2014, uh, the first new drug for acute lymphoblastic leukemia was approved. It's called Um I wish I had a slide for it, but um, if you go online and look for immunotherapy, you'll find that uh, there's a lot of uh, news about immunotherapy. Um, so what it does is to... Um, so cancer cells have different ways of hiding from chemotherapy. They have a wall of cells that they use to shield themselves off from um, our own cells that can fight, in, you know, your cancer. For example, we have a lot of T cells, B cells. They can, they have the ability to fight their own cancer cells, but they don't have the capacity because they have been shielded by other cells which are recruited by the cancer cells. Okay, so these drugs are meant <laughs> to bring together the cancer cell with your own body cells, so they, your body cells can kill the cancer cells. Okay, so that is a bite-specific antibody, or bite, they call it. Um, CAR-T is a chimeric antigen receptor T cell. So what they do is um, they make T cells where on one end you have an antibody against the cancer. On the other side, they have a receptor for your own T cells. So they're basically marrying the two together so that they can come together. On one side, they have a receptor for the cancer cell. On the other side, they have a receptor for T cell. So your own T cells can come and, you know, in close contact with the cancer cell. Once the cancer, once the cancer cell comes together with the T cell, you know, the T cells can do its business, okay, of killing cancer cells. So whereas before, the cancer cells couldn't be, you know, attacked because the T cells had no ability to go close to them. Now we have things which we can do to do that, okay? So that's the new realm of chemotherapy and cancer therapy. I think in, in the province, this is already approved for, lymphoma, for leukemia, and it's funded. CAR-T is expensive, it's half a million dollars for one treatment, okay? So there are some companies that are making them, but in, um, in Canada, uh, the Canadian 
transplant group is trying to roll out its own CAR T therapy. So they have uh, our own kind of in-house machine to make CAR T cheap and cheerful. Um, so we'll get there, okay? So the studies have already started. So there are in the centers in Vancouver, in Ottawa, Toronto, where if you have the right kind of patient, you can go and get CAR T therapy, okay? Uh, there are still new challenges we have because with the new drugs come new side effects we don't know much about. There are some of these side effects. They are quite profound side effects that we've not seen. Typically significant brain toxicity and other things. So there are things that we have to uh, figure out. And even more is the financial implication of it because these treatments are expensive. And um, um, I've been in uh, at least three countries. I was trained in England. I worked in Singapore. And I'm here now. And I can say that um, in England, forget about all these things. The only way people can get access to CAR T through a clinical trial, there's no way NHS can fund something like that. You know, it's in financial crisis. Singapore is even worse. It's fully privately funded. There is no access to government fund, you know, for treatment like this. If you have insurance, you have a chance to get the treatment. Otherwise, there's no recourse to anything like this. Um, Singapore, I mean, Canada. I think that when I came here, I found that some of the drugs that I didn't have access to in Singapore, I have access to here. So there are some challenges. I think we're only going to get worse because these drugs are expensive. And moreover, some of them are not cure. You've got to take them forever. You know, for example, imatinib. You've got to take it forever. Likewise, most of the pills that come out these days, you know, they don't give you a cure. You have to take them for a long time and, uh, you know, additive financial toxicity. So. There are some challenges, but I think if you look at the bigger picture, um, at least, you know, some of the patients who would have, you know, died otherwise, you know, they are living for a long, long time. And that is good, good quality of life, and that's important. Question. Is uh, that is that have a retail name like Bleebeck? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, Bleebeck is, um, one minute. <laughs> <laughs> Blink Cycle, B L I N C Y C O. So, yeah, so, you know, retracting that, imagining I think um, the province is trying to figure out how to, you know, make sure that the right patients get it, et cetera, et cetera. But I think in five years' time, we'll be in a much uh, sort of nicer position in terms of access to drugs. Um, anyway, I just wanted to have one word about clinical trials, and I think. Um, I find that, um, you know, being a small place in the northern Canada, there are some issues with access to clinical trials, um, but we are trying to address some of the issues where patients are so far away that they don't have access to clinical trials. One of the things that we are trying to do is to open some of the trials here and be able to get treatment in the local centers wherever you are, trying to work with, uh, you know, the uh, federal centers. So there are some challenges, but we are trying to get there and, um, HSN has some active clinical trials, both in uh, in the myeloma, some lymphoma coming up, um, and in certainly in other cancers there are plenty. Um, one thing that you should try to remember is that um, today's rituximab was a clinical trial 10 years ago, and now, you know, imagine if, for example, it was again a clinical trial 10 years ago. Not all of them are going to be like, you know, wonder drugs. Many of them will fail, but the only way to do that or find out that would be to go through clinical trials. So. Generally, we have three phases of clinical trials, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one is the um, earliest one where they're just looking for safety, you know, to see whether the drug is safe or not. Um, and um, that's when they start with a small uh, dose of drug and you escalate the dose of drug and find out what, at what dose the maximum tolerated dose is, that's what's called NTD. So that dose will be taken to the next phase, which is phase two, where they look for efficacy. And that's when they don't compare it with anything else. They just do a single phase study with uh, 100 or 200 patients to see what is the effect of it. And once they find it's interesting, then they'll approve, uh, apply to FDA for a phase three study where they compare it with a standard of care and see how different it is. So um, some of the drugs actually were approved based on phase two study because we don't have good drugs for many conditions. For example, in myeloma, a drug called Tarkisumib was approved purely based on phase two. So there was no phase three data. Um, for example, Blingatumumab was in approved based on phase two studies. So there are areas where there are so few options that sometimes FDA agrees to approve based on phase two studies. But these days, 
um, most good studies would need a, a nice phase three comparative data to see that you know it really is different to what standard of care because these drugs are not cheap and if they really want to see that you know there is an effect compared to the uh, standard of care so all of these are done with the strictest ethical and all the rest of it okay so they have to go through the local ethical guidelines and uh, make sure that you know all the uh, study protocols and everything are you know followed and the right consent is taken so you can be assured that when and when we're trying to bring studies in science mode especially we are not taking any risk with the early phase one studies because we don't want to make you know we want to make sure that we do it safely so most of the studies that we choose are phase two or phase three if you go to Toronto, uh, probably you'll find phase one centers doing phase one studies, but we do not do that because we need a dedicated phase one center, which we don't have. Um, typically, a phase two or phase three. One word about bone marrow transplant, and I bet I'll start in probably in five more minutes. So, bone marrow transplant is not an operation, it's not like kidney transplant. So, it's like a blood donation sort of thing, okay? Um, there are two types. The first uh, step is to collect stem cell from somebody. If it's autologous, which is your own stem cell, you typically collect it after giving a bit of chemotherapy because normally stem cells do not come out of bone marrow. They tend to you know, hide inside, not too high in numbers. So the only way to stimulate them would be to give some chemotherapy or use a certain injection called a growth stimulating factor at high doses. That's when the stem cells will start floating into blood. And once you have stem cells in the blood, they will filter them off, just like blood donation, and um, freeze them in nitrogen and infuse them back into you later on, and that is autologous stem cell transplant. If it's a donor transplant, which is typically used for leukemia, this is used for lymphoma and myeloma. In leukemia, we cannot use your own stem cell because um, your stem cells are often likely to be contaminated with cancer cells. Um, and that's a bigger problem in leukemia. Not, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen in this, but it's less relevant here because we have good treatments. Whereas leukemia is a slightly different story. We want to make sure that the uh, um, donor, so your donor stem cells are, even though they are matched for you, they are still different to you. Whereas your own stem cells are your own stem cells. You know, you, do, you don't have immune reaction. In leukemia, we want the immune reaction from the donor to kill the cancer cells also. So we call it gram versus leukemia effect um, because the uh, lymphocytes that you get from the donor will identify the cancer cells as uh, abnormal and kill them. And this is over and above the side effect, the effect that you get from the chemotherapy that you give during transplant. Whereas in this kind of transplant, that reaction of gram versus leukemia is not there. You only, you're only entirely depending on the chemotherapy that you use during the transplant. But the benefit is that this is much less toxic, whereas this is far more toxic. You're looking at, um, you know, one to two years of commitment after bone marrow transplant from a donor because you've got to deal with the long-term complications from graft versus leukemia. Whereas here, the trouble is only for that one month when you're in hospital, when you're going through the chemotherapy, and after that, generally, you are, um, you're okay. You're out of the law in a side effect. In MDS, for example, we would go with uh, allogeneic transplant. That's what we normally do. So um, I think with that... Yeah, so cord blood is done, but it's one of our favor, sort of, uh, more or less. You know, we used to do cord blood a lot more. Um, it's very favorable in uh, China, for example, mm -hmm. and in um, places where there are no good registries, okay? So um, in India or China, where the uh, unrelated registry is not that big, um, cord blood is a good source to go. But in the um, Western world, generally, the chance of finding a perfect match is close to 70 percent, um, so it's pretty high, unless you are like a weird lineage or something like that, where you know, <laughs> then you are in trouble. But you know, most of the bog standard, you know, Caucasian or you know, you're able to find a match. <laughs> so I think I don't know what uh, you know whether this was effective or not, or you know, it was a lot of information. I just wanted to convey. And I think um, there are still some improvements in um, treatment, but there are significant challenges. And I just um, wanted to give you a bit of a, bit of a good note about what they're doing and uh, what you can do in terms of, uh, you know, um, clinical participation in clinical trials. Yeah, that's about it. We have to open up for a few questions. Mm -hmm. I got people you did a great job summarizing that. That's a nice topic. And the best terminology that you can possibly need is. Um, just like I said, multiple myeloma, I had a few um, friends that got it and they were seeking medical help multiple times over the, the six months prior to diagnosis and went almost paralyzed before they died of it and were ready to be discharged that day. And then when he said, I can't feel my team and I'm falling, um, basically got diagnosed stage three. And it's like, it's those generic systems, like it's fatigue, it's back aches, heart 
Tricky, right? I don't know what to, I mean, you know, you are telling the doctor to do the test for you, right? And it doesn't go well generally. hemoglobin and, um, you know, in anybody, they should have further investigations. You know, back pain with low hemoglobin, that's a sure shot sign that something wrong is there. You know, either you're bleeding from somewhere or you're not making enough blood cells. Okay, so if you find that, you know, either there's a raised creatinine or if there is an anemia, then I think that warrants further investigation, so without a doubt. Is the if the total protein is raised, yeah. you know, if you look at the liver function, you find that the total protein is raised and the albumin is low, then there is something going on there, you know, what's going on in between. So, you know, the things to look for, anemia, isolated, or isolated renal dysfunction, or a, you know, dissociation between the albumin and the protein level. Yeah. So that's the general problem. Yeah, you should be able to pick it up. Then shown in urine, it's not that helpful. It used to be uh, of much help in the past. Um, but in the um, recent times, the last 10, 15 years, we haven't used, I mean, at least most of the uh, experts don't recommend doing Ben Jones as a uh, test for screening for myeloma because um, not everybody has Ben Jones. And, uh, you know, uh, and even if you have Ben Jones, it doesn't mean that you have myeloma. So, you know, the test is not that useful. You, you know, if you're really suspecting myeloma, you have to go and do the uh, serum protein electrophoresis, which is the gold standard, you know, yeah. So does that ever get misdiagnosed as osteoporosis? Yeah, yeah. So it can happen. So we've had cases where the bones were thin and the MRI showed. Um, so the bone changes in MRI in myeloma can be two types. One is where it's diffusely thinned, making it look like osteoporosis, or it can really show lithic lesions where there's punched out both in different places. And uh, um, now we realize that, uh, so, you know, some of these patients actually have a paraprotein in the blood. The ones who had previously been called as osteoporosis, if you go and do their blood test, some of them have paraprotein. Um, so now we are recognizing that some of these people may be having a form of myeloma that, uh, you know, if you had thought more about, probably could have done. And generally it's useful because then we can treat them with uh, bisphosphonates, which is a treatment for people with myeloma because they have weak bones. And you were saying that there's high calcium. Yes. It's the opposite, yeah. Yeah, yeah. High calcium is a late sign in myeloma, though. Yeah, yeah. It just shows that the bone has been destroyed so much that all the calcium is too high. Yeah, it doesn't happen in the early stages. So then somebody might look like they have osteo, uh, and then be treated for that. Yeah. Be given what is it, the nosomat, yeah, yeah. And are getting more calcium. Yeah, it can happen. Yeah. yeah. So that's why you need to look at the osteoporosis would not cause anemia. No. You know, so you, you should look for the other, pain, yeah, other signs of it, yeah. And the back pain is because of the renal problems? That no, it's because of uh, fracture of uh, spine. So if you have a, you know, compression fracture of spine, you tend to get uh, nerves pinched off when right. they come out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
In most cases, that doesn't happen. What you do is you transplant once and you do maintenance, and then it comes back in the future. Um, and typically, if you get two to three years from the first transplant, there's an argument for doing a second transplant of the same type. Um, it used to be stronger in the past, and we didn't have good drugs for myeloma. Now, because we have better drugs in terms of relapse, the argument for a second transplant has gone down, but it's very cost effective because we only have to, you know, one treatment for with a new drug, you can do one transplant. Okay, so it's very cost effective. So if you look at it from a cost, you know, economic perspective, it will make sense to do a second transplant. It depends on how much benefit you got from the first one. If the myeloma came back significantly or big time within a year, for example, or a year and a half from the first transplant, a second transplant is completely worthless. But if you get say two or three years or even longer from the first one, and you're still within sort of reasonable health for a second transplant, I would still do it, provided we have enough stem cells collected in the first instance. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Myeloma, uh, myeloma is it no, most cases are random. Um, but having said that, I've seen some familial myelomas where, you know, Different people, you know, same family, multiple people have gotten it, but in most cases, it's random, and you cannot screen for it. That's the bottom line, you know. Unlike the breast cancer, you can look for BRCA gene, and if you have BRCA gene, there is a fairly high chance that you get BRCA related cancer, and you can do, you know, breast removal. We can't do such a thing. There is no screening for cancer in, in myeloma, for example. So, even if you had a family relative or thing, the only thing you can do is to be religious in doing blood tests and looking for symptoms, you know. So, you should do an annual blood test where you check your abdomen, check your protein level, check your kidney function, and uh, be very, um, you know, vigilant about it, really. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Or? Yeah. MDS and myeloma? Uh, no. MDS and myeloma are very uh, sort of distinct in terms of appearance in the bone marrow. Um, MDS can be a, a, a challenging one to diagnose because um, unlikely, unlikely, because myeloma has, you know, if you do blood tests, there are certain things that are very evident and clear in myeloma, nothing ambiguous about it. We have a paraprotein. Yes, the chromosome changes and the bone marrow appearance are very typical of myeloma and very distinct from MDS. So it's very unlike, you know, but MDS diagnosis itself is challenging. It's very challenging. This is challenging and also even diagnosis is challenging. It gives you a good clue because, you know, there are some changes which are unique to MDS, which you don't see in other conditions. Yeah. What treatment is he getting? Sorry? Watching weight? Okay. So it's a low risk MDS then, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. With ASA, the injection, right? Yeah. Sometimes if the blood counts are low, you can go directly to transplant. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to first of all thank our speakers. I want to thank Chloe and I want to thank Dr. Gopal Krishna. We just have a little something for Dr. Thank you. So much. <laughs> Thank you very much for this evening. It's yeah, so, been so helpful. I think uh, patients and families often are, don't get this great, like, yeah. specific information. Yeah, I mean, if you have, um, you know, certain uh, things that we, that we should spend more time on, you know, if you can let us know, if, 